Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I want to take a look at Open Indiana right after this. So what I'm going to be looking at today is Open Indiana 2020.10, which of course came out in October of last year. It's nice to say last year on 2020, isn't it? But uh, what exactly is Open Indiana? So Open Indiana is a free and open source Unix operating system that was originally derived from Open Solaris and Illumos. Uh, open Indiana developers forked uh, Open Solaris after it was killed off by Oracle. So yeah, they just didn't feel like they wanted to. They wanted to concentrate. Well, they felt like they wanted to concentrate on eleven on Solaris eleven, and they didn't want to have a team working on the open source version while they were trying to get eleven out the door. So Open Indiana gets its name from the original Sun Microsystems code name for Solaris, which was called Project Indiana. The goals of Open Indiana is to provide a secure and a free of charge operating system for production servers. So that was the whole goal of it. And one of the uh, original Project Indiana team members was Ian Murdoch, of course, the founder of Debian. Uh, and Open Indiana was initially released in September 14th, 2010. So not very old, about 10 years old now, uh, almost 11. <laughs> uh, so... AT&T and Sun Microsystems uh, and the origins of Solaris, this is where this came from, AT&T and Sun Microsystems in 1987, they jointly worked on a merger of Berkeley Software Distribution, Unix System 5, and Xenix called System 5 Release 4.2. I've talked about that before. I was working for AT&T at the time, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it scared, <clears throat> like I've said before, it scared everyone to death when this happened. Uh, because this was this was uh, viewed by the industry as AT and T taking over, uh, <laughs> but uh, actually uh, it just blew itself apart. So September the fourth, nineteen ninety one, Sun announced it was replacing Sun OS, which was their original operating system, with a system based on System Five Release Four point two, and they initially called it Sun OS Five, but it quickly became Solaris two to differentiate itself from its older BSD-based uh, system. So uh, it was only initially supported on Spark, but Sun planned to release the next 86 variant of the OS, and they finally did that in June of 1993. So just a couple of years later, they, they got around to doing that, and that was called Solaris 2.1. It was only a desktop release, and I think that accompanied one of their their first forays into workstations. So Solaris 2.4 uh, was released in 1994 and that unified the Spark and the x86 code base. So rather than have, it's typical that when you have separate project teams working on stuff, you do get some divergence and so they brought it back together again. It comes with a lot of features, and I'm sorry about the eye chart, but you know, it comes with ZFS, it comes with DTrace, it comes with Crossbow. Uh, the SMF is the service management facility in which you can use to build packages. Uh, there's the fault man. <laughs> I know that's a simplification. It does uh, the fault management architecture. It has Comstar, which is the iSCSI target system. Uh, KVM, uh, Zones, it supports, which was their, uh, Zones was Sun's first foray into containerization. And I remember that they were way ahead of everyone else when they brought out Zones. Uh, but the problem with Zones, Zones is very good, but the problem with it, it just, it was only running on Solaris. And like I said, the industry had viewed this as the devil, and so there, it wasn't getting as much traction as it needed. And of course, it wasn't Docker. But Zones is a very good containerization strategy, and it's a very good system. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an excellent system. Time Slider, which allows you to automate your ZFS snapshots. Uh, we'll probably take a look at that today. Uh, RBAC, of course, and IPMMP, which is the, net, the IP network multipathing, and then Dump data link multipathing as well. Uh, it is a, a very robust operating system. It's been used for years in servers, uh, not Open Indiana, but Open Solaris. 
was used. I, I know we had a couple of instances of it. Of course, we ran Solaris on the Spark gear. Um, yeah. What do you need to run it? Well, you need a 64-bit CPU. Uh, if you're going to run a server, you'll need about 16 gig of disk space, depending upon how much storage you need for the uh, for the packages you're going to install. <clears throat> Two gigabyte plus of memory, and of course, keep in mind that when Open Indiana installs, it installs by fault ZFS, so you'll need to size this appropriately for your needs and the size of your ZFS pools. Same thing with the desktop, 64-bit, 20 gig of disk space, and 4 gig plus the memory, uh, <clears throat> which you'll find that you'll quickly run out of. Even, even 8 gig you can run out of quickly as well. Uh, it just depends, again, on how many packages you install. ZFS is installed by default as the root file system on the desktop version as well. So I guess the first thing we need to do is I need to reconfigure my workstation here and then let's go bring up and install uh, Open Indiana. So I'll be right back. Okay, so I have my, my uh, VM up and I am going to have to use a VM for this today. There are some special things that you will need for this. So let's just do... Let's just give it a name, and of course, we we'll need to get the ISO file, and I have two here. This is the server, and that's the GUI. I can take the defaults for this, no problem. Uh, this one, however, let's see. I'm going to put this over here, and I think, if I remember, trying to remember what I had to do here. Can I do it here? No, that's fine. Probably have to do it later. Let's see. I'm going to give it eight, 8 gig of memory. Well, my one key is still not working very well. And I am going to make this Intel. We'll go ahead and make this out. I need to make one change though. For some reason, it didn't show what I needed on the list. So let me go back to the server view. There we go. And then this right here will not work. It won't find it. It won't find a driver for it. But what I did find is I just tried two of these. So uh, I tried the default, I tried the the, uh, the, the uh, LSI and the VERT IO SCSI, which didn't work. So my next choice was VMware, and that one worked. So let's try this. Let's see if this will work. Let's go ahead and launch it. Bring up the console. Okay. We'll go ahead and hit enter to let it go on. It will eventually go in. It just takes a little time. Okay, so the default is English. We'll take that. Then it should come up with the GUI here in a minute to, to start configuring. Here we go. I think the first thing I need to do is <laughs> get, uh, get my hardware settings set. Let's see, I want displays. Let me get the, let me find out what, what on earth it's doing here. Oh, okay, let's, uh, Set this to we got to fit. Yeah, it looks fine, I think. Yeah, I think that might work. We'll see. Looks like it's still I don't know why it's so exploded. Um uh, but anyway, um so you notice that I didn't have any trouble with the driver. This allows you to go and check the drivers to make sure you have them all and uh, let's just let it do that. Well, 
this is going to come up. There it is. I'll probably get two of them now. Yep. Okay. We'll go ahead and do that. So that'll check over and make sure that you do have drivers in the system. Uh, it's always a good idea to check that and make sure that you're not missing anything. Um, yeah, this comes up. Uh, this comes up fine. So we should be able to get going here. So and then if you want to partition out the drives the way you want it, you can do that. But I am just going to go ahead and install since this is ZFS. And uh, that's what we want to let it do. I'm going to get this up so I can get to the next key down here. So it's going to use the entire disk. That's good. Uh, I could set this to whatever region I want. I'm just going to leave it at GMT, UTC. That's fine. Uh, it should have already selected English, and it did. And, I, and the territory is the United States, which is fine. Then it wants a brute password. I'm going to set one up. This is only temporary because the first time you come in and use the root uh, password, it will say, your root password is expired. And we should have a name for the system as Open Indiana, and that's fine. Just uh, a verification of what I put in, and if it all looks good, we'll go ahead and install it. And this will take a few minutes. So I'm going to pause it here, and I'll be back when it's done. Okay, so it's all finished, and I'm going to reboot the system, but... Uh, Actually, what I really want to do is to shut this down, but we'll go ahead and reboot it, and then we can take a look at some of the things in it. So what I want to do here is come over and shut this down. So I'm going to do that. I already have one that's set up that I want to go through a little bit. So why, I guess while we're in here, let me get rid of that and here. Let's go over to the website for a minute and take a look at some of the features and that, that is on the website. So they... They have their, they always have their latest information posted here, and their documentation is located here. So let's go there. When I first came in here, this was a little confusing. Normally on most websites, you expect to see, oh, here's how to install it, and no, it's up here. So there's an about where you can go and learn more about Open Indiana. There's a handbook that'll go through the common tasks and getting started and your network. Um, so one of my comments about this is it's pretty good until you start getting into some of the things like here. Uh, it's, it gets a little lightweight on some of the explanations. And I think, I mean, it's, it's good, don't get me wrong, but I think, it, I think some of us need to help them finish out this documentation. Um, I don't usually, I'm not complaining about it. This is just a more of, hey, people just rolling up their sleeves and, and getting in to help. Uh, there's a, yeah, it goes through, it does a pretty good job, but when you start getting into uh, how to install audio and how do you play back audio and all of those things, it doesn't have spaces in it that says, uh, coming soon or in work. Yeah, so, yeah. It does, it, it does need a little bit of help. Yeah, here's a placeholder for the content. So stuff like this, I think we really need to help them out and finish out this documentation with them. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it is pretty good for the most part. Um, but let's see if this is done yet. Should be. Yeah, okay. Let's go over here and let's start that up. I'm going to bring up the council window. <clears throat> this is probably going to be huge, too. Yeah, and I can already tell what it is.
uh, try to bring the screen down to within a reasonable size. I mean, I, I mean, it's good in a way because then you can see it better, but it's a magnification that's on and I don't see an option on the GUI to set it, so I'm going to have to figure that out later. I'll let you know what I found out. Yeah, clearly this, this should be in the middle of the screen. So obviously this is Mate. Yeah, let me... <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me get this under control here. Just a little bit. Um, let me see. Maybe I should go down to that much. Let's see. There we go. Now it's fitting a little bit better. Yeah, keep that. That's fine. No, no, no. That's fine. Close that. Get out of there. All right. So obviously I've made some modifications. This is Mate. Uh, they do have a number of other uh, desktops if you prefer a different one you can and of course I have changed this but some of the things up here uh, that you have is this is a, the power manager and of course this is a server and so it's not, that's probably not going to do too much this is your configuration for time slider which is a automatic way of we'll go ahead and do that It allows me to enable the time slider in the back. It takes up, it just regularly does stuff. You can, you know, as far as doing snapshots on the ZFS pools. And you, there are some advanced options here that you can also work with. It can, you know, it, you can replicate the backups to an external drive and all these things too that if you want, you can do all that. So it's pretty nice. I mean, that's, that's a nice way of, now, uh, that's, uh, this would be okay to back up, but uh, the snapshots don't rely on that as a backup. It's not what they're really meant for. They're meant to, for, as a placeholder on your file system to roll back in the event that you install something you don't really want and something you want to get rid of completely, right? So let's take a look at it. So the, the things that it comes with is you a character map in Grandpa, uh, archive manager, and a Mate cal calculator, font viewer. Pluma is a text editor. You can take a screenshot. There's a now I put on LibreOffice. I had to install that, and I had to install the package manager. There is instructions out on their site to do this, uh, but you have to actually add the package uh, the package repo for this, and then it will install. Uh, I think it's the latest version. It's pretty close. Um, so let's see graphics. Uh, I did try to install GIMP. GIMP is out here. Uh, it obviously needs a little bit more because it failed on the eGPL. So I, th yeah, it, it, it didn't have it installed, and I couldn't find it in the uh, pa default packages. So I'm sure there's an, another package manager I need to install to be able to get that to work. So and then there's Firefox. It Firefox is. I don't know if I'll be able to get all the way back. No, not no. Um, yeah, probably not going to be able to get to the bottom of it. It's 60.1 is what it is. So, <clears throat> a little old. A little old. Um, yeah. And you have Pigeon, Thunderbird, Tiger BNC Viewer, Office. Now, it, it came with a Trill, and it came with a Mate Dictionary, and these I have added. So, uh, as far as sound, you have uh, Brasso for creating and copying CDs. You have CD Ripper. If you have an audio CD and then sound, you can modify your volume and events. System tools, zero config browser. You have Kaja, which is your file manager. It's this. Uh, these are custom icons that I downloaded and put in. <clears throat> the uh, I, I just like these better. And then I, I did put on a few packages in order for it to work. Let's, uh, let's see. I did, I did compile this, I think. Uh, maybe it's in the, I haven't moved it, so. Now, HTOP, HTOP was here, so I was able to get that okay. So it is a, this is 5.11, of course, uh, based on Solaris 5.11. That's the way that uh, Solaris indicates their, their things. Um, the last time I worked on Solaris was version 10. We were trying to go to 11, and I think 
Oracle at that time had outsourced some of the development of Solaris 11. And so my customer was having, having a problem with that. And so they, they wanted us to get the source code and submit it for review before they would accept the operating system because they had been used to it always being done on, on shore here. So they, uh, we negotiated with Oracle. They would not give it to us, but they would send the source code for evaluation to them. And so they did that. And I don't know what happened. The, the Air Force said, no, you cannot put this up. And, uh, and I think they went back and forth with Oracle a few times, and I know they got it straightened out. But I think there were some things in the operating system that the Air Force just didn't like. So that happens. Uh, it's, it doesn't reflect badly on the operating system. It's just you find they find that in our code all the time, too. They, they have some very strict rules about how, uh, how things work and it has to fit that particular rule set. And if it doesn't, it doesn't pass. So... Yeah, uh, not to, it doesn't speak ill of Solaris. It's just that's the normal kind of thing that happens. Uh, as far as uh, HTOP, yeah, I think it, it, it starts out at about 2 gig, and it will, of course, ratchet up as you start using ZFS. I need to set up an ARC, and, uh, and if I were to use this in production for any length of time, I would set this up properly on hardware. Um, um, but... It doesn't, it's, I mean, as far as the system is concerned, I remember on most of the uh, Solaris workstations that they had to, they usually had to have 16 gig of memory in them in order to actually do any useful work. And uh, I remember running around 8 gig most of the time uh, as a developer, you know, building up stuff on those machines. It's, it's about what it took. So, uh, at, yeah, they, they, but then, you know, it depends on what you have out here. As far as, um, and of course you have your system controls here. No places is just where your folders are. Yeah, you can connect to servers and all of that. One of the things that I was going to mention is that somebody, uh, somebody asked about uh, how much open source did Sun Microsystems contribute to the community uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, open source has been, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't called open source until Roger Stallman called it that. We called it public domain uh, in the early days, and it just meant that if I placed something in the public domain, you were free to use it in any way you wanted. Sun donated a lot of code. I mean, NFS came from them, uh, the network file system that came from Sun. Uh, there was also something called the new workstation, or new WS, that was a replacement for X11. And there was, that got rolled out into open source. And then there was some competition that went on inside of, so I don't know. I had a friend of mine that worked for them and he was always trying to get me to come down and join them. And I was like, you know, I was a little worried about Sun. They, they were spending a lot of money and it didn't look like they were really healthy uh, at the time when I was looking, looking to move uh yeah, when I was looking to move, and uh, so I just didn't, I didn't really want to go there. But um, as it turned out, I was right. They, 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 yeah, they were not doing well. Um, they were making a lot of money. They were also spending a lot of money. But anyway, there, there was some competition, apparently, between the X11 group, and then there was another group that did another GUI. Uh, and then uh, the new S, new WS group, and and so I don't know what happened, but new WS all of a sudden just got dumped. I mean, they uh, Oracle, uh, not Oracle, but Sun Microsystems just stopped supporting it, and uh, and I don't know if it's around anymore or not. If it's out in the open source repositories, it might be uh, out there somewhere. It seems like once it's open source, it's always open source. So just like this operating system, I mean, uh, Sun rolled this entire operating system out into open source and um, made it available for anyone that wanted to use it. And you could use it any way you wanted. It is a CDDL license, though. At least the original open source was. I, I, noticed, I, I noticed that on the licensing for uh, Open Indiana, they don't specifically say CDDL, but they, they do have, because it's part of Luminos, and Luminos has some uh, code in here as well. So yeah, I'm not sure how that all works out, but uh, it is not a GPL license. So if you're wondering about that, it is not. 
So yeah, I have my hardware, my keyboard, my mouse, power management, sound, internet network, proxy, look and feel. And there's my uh, Compiz config. And in here, I can actually modify uh, some additional components on how I want things to look. You know, there's extras and image loading and there's utility. There's just tons of stuff to do here to set it up and make it look the way you want. Now, Compaz, Comp of course, is a, an, an, it's, it's like a add-on. It's like, a, you know, the, it'll add on stuff to the screen. So at least that's the way I understand it. It's been a long time since I've used Solaris. So forgive me if I say something, misspeak, but it has been mm, 10 years plus <laughs> since I've used Solaris as a workstation. Uh, yeah, I'm a little rusty. One, one, uh, so here you have your control center, and you can change the look and feel. You can personalize it, change the theme, get preferred apps, uh, and you can also uh, you can also set applications to launch automatically if you want. So that's kind of nice. It's always been uh, as a development workstation, Solaris has always been a good one to use. Um, it uh, I used it for from about 1994. Yeah, it had to be '94 because I was involved with uh, with the uh, with the one of the astronomy clubs, and uh, Comet Shoemaker Le Levy was was about to hit Jupiter, and I had a Sun workstation and um, took it out to the observatory and tied it into the Vatican telescope and the South Pole telescope because the South Pole at the time had the best view of Jupiter. We could see it, but we couldn't see the impacts like they could. They were right on the fringe, and as the as the uh, comet was starting to collide with the atmosphere of Jupiter, of course, they, it exploded, and they would get these big plumes. That, and so, uh, in real time, we were able to watch what was going on as well as see the aftermath as, as it came around uh, in front of us. Uh, anyway, it was it was kind of a cool thing, and we were using the sun to do that. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that was back quite a ways ago. But um, let me uh, let me just drop out to the terminal again for just a second. I want to do my usual. So as you can see, this is uh, it. Should, it says uh, i eighty six PC, but it is a sixty four bit OS, uh, and then i three eighty six and i eighty six PC again. So uh, it there are. They do support 32-bit applications in in, in, in uh, Open Indiana, and uh, but it is a 64-bit OS, of course. Yeah, let's see. As far as some of the commands, uh, one of the ones that you can use is this one. pfexec is like sudo, except if you do sudo, you get prompted for a password. pfexec you don't, um, but the difference is pfexec is limited. And what it can do is root, so and that's kind of a nice thing. I, I wish Linux would adopt some of these things that came from, uh, that came over from the Unix side of the house. It would be really nice to see some of these utilities make their way over. Uh, let's take a look at the pool, and it is a single drive, of course. So, and it should be. Let me just, there we go. Let me, if I can get this above. Well, okay. Maybe that sort of do it. Um, let's do a clear. Do it that way. You can see that the organization is similar to a lot of different systems that do Z, uh, ZFS uh, where they... Uh, well, each one of the major file systems is is uh, out here. One of the things that I didn't talk about with PF Exec that really makes it nice is what if you want to do a tail? You can you can see it didn't ask me for a password. It allows me to go in and read the read those things. So uh, yeah. Let me clear this again. So, 
It is different. I mean, the, you don't have system D on this. This is back to the init. This uses init. This is Unix, not Linux. So uh, you you won't find those kinds of things over here. So if you want that, stay on Linux. The idea behind Open Indiana, though, was to make an environment that if you were coming from Linux to do development, you would find it, that it was very similar to the way Linux operates. And so you would quickly be able to get your wheels under you. And, it, and it, you know, based on the mate and some of that, I mean, that's, that is uh, true, I think. So what I'm, I'm going to do is uh, stop here for a second and then give you kind of my final thoughts on this. Okay, so pros. Mate is the latest version that's available. At the time that I've done this video, it's the same version that uh, is on Linux 1.24.1. ZFS is the default file system. I like that uh, for both. And I have tested the server and the workstation both. And the server does require quite a bit more setup, of course. Uh, and so you'll have to dig into the manuals. You may even end up over in the Oracle repository because there is some additional documentation there that you might want to read about Solaris because this is 11. And you can... You can it is you can use some of the commands now. Of course, there are some things that are a little different, but it isn't too bad. Documentation on the wiki is good, but I think we need to get in and help them and uh, try to help them get some of it completed. Uh, <laughs> developers never like to do documentation. I, I, I'm guilty of that. Open Indiana, uh, I, yeah, was meant to make a comfortable environment for users coming from Linux. So Firefox the version is old, but you know you can always download a new copy of that. There used to be in, uh, in Solaris on x86, there used to be a graphical package manager, and I did not see any evidence of that. So I don't know what's become of that, whether that's something they cannot use. It was never rolled out into the open source side of things, but uh, it would be, and now maybe I just I haven't found it, or maybe it's a package I need to set up and install. I need to do some more research on that. So I'm not going to say that as a con. I'm just going to, it's a question. So I, I just don't know. Uh, like I said, it's been so long since I've been in, in, uh, in working with Solaris that, yeah. But I do remember there was a package manager that was graphical that you could go in and pick out stuff that you wanted to install. And uh, I did not see any evidence of that being in Open Indiana. So, but I mean, you can always drop to the command line and do that. So it's not a big deal. It uses the package. Uh, PKG mechanism for installing packages. Um, so it is a little bit different, uh, but not much, <clears throat> not much. It has some extra features in it that uh, um, the BSD does not have. So anyway, that's all I had for today. Uh, if uh, if you want to try this out, um, let me know. I'm, I think I want to try this out on hardware next. Uh yeah, because there's some things I'd like to see. There is a driver in here for NVIDIA that's uh, included with the system. And I'd like to play around with zones a little bit more and, and expand the ZFS pool to use a full, a full RAID-based ZFS pool and then add a, a data pool as well. So I might try to bring some of that over and experiment around with that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sun gave us an awful lot, and they, you know, some people say that they the problem with them is they didn't transition to the cloud, but people forget that Sun, <laughs> they forget the, the, uh, the tagline that they always use was the, the network is the computer. That was the cloud. I mean, they, the Sun was in almost, they were, they were in the middle of the dot com, and I don't know. I just remember racks and racks of walking through stuff. And when I I was working as an IT director at a hospital, and I was fed up with NetWare. I was just totally fed up with it. And I brought and I had a mainframe machine from from uh, Burroughs, and I needed to be able to do three things. The first thing I needed to be able to do was that there was the person that was in charge of the data center before me had not had, had gone out and, and really botched up the wiring for the terminals. And so they were iffy, a lot of cold solder joints in them. And, and there was all kinds of problems with just the applications just not working right. 
So when I took over, I spent a lot of time looking at what was what was needed and came up with, they had three hospitals. It was actually a, a physical therapy uh, clinic. They had three hospitals that they worked with and they needed to be able to get the systems online to those other sites and it was very expensive to do that. So what I did was I brought in a, a Sun, I think it was a Spark Server 5, spent some time you know, setting it up and getting uh, I set up, uh, I think it was T1 back then. Yeah, it was T1. I set up a triangulated uh, network between the three major hospitals and us at the base, and then put satellite communications out to the other hospital, which was about 18 miles away. There was also a, 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 another clinic that was about 12 miles away that was in line of sight to the top of the building of one of the hospitals downtown. So it could see, <laughs> so we just, you know, 50 gigahertz radio, I think is what we used uh, to get the communications out to that site. And of course that that worked well in certain kinds of weather and then when it was rainy, it didn't work. It, you would, it would degrade in performance. It wouldn't drop, but it would, it would just get slower. But uh, yeah, we, <laughs> it's a couple of times we had to go up and clean off the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, dish, but it worked pretty well. It, it worked pretty well. Um, the uh, hospital was the purest. They were netware. They, they just thought I was crazy until one day I came in and I wanted to, to we had a secondary building that we had an office in that was next to the hospital and they had a fiber optic connection that went across there. I tried to use, tried to ride my TCP IP on top of their existing circuits with netware and uh, they would boot me and the, the packets would get lost and it was just a mess. So I finally talked him into giving me a pair of fiber to myself. And when I came in, I, I had these two LEC devices that cost about $150, I think, for the pair. That was basically, a, it was a light transfer to a wired Ethernet. And I, I, uh, I took uh, the Ethernet cable, I plugged it into the LEC, plugged the fiber in, it was single mode fiber, and, uh, and then plugged the fiber in uh, to one end. They, and then it went over to the other side, plugged the fiber into the other end, and then plugged the Ethernet back into the uh, router. And uh, and they went, how much did that cost? And I said it was about 150 bucks. And they go, what? 150 bucks? You know how much it costs us to do a line of fiber? It's $3,000 for us. And I was like, well, you could have gone this way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, yeah. It wasn't, uh, I don't know how much longer it took them to get away and start seeing the advantages of TCP IP, but they eventually went, uh, yeah, the network just went <laughs> down the road after that. Uh, we never used it. I just, I just knew better. I wasn't going to go down that, uh, that, uh, I wasn't going to go on that trail. That was a dead end. And we used the sun for several things. I used it as, uh, uh, it, it was used as a, a collector for billing. And patient records, so it would collect from the mainframe, and then had it had a database that it ran, and then it it there was a satellite machine that was downtown, that I could so we had we had the ability to operate in the event that there was some kind of storm or power failure at the main office, which happened occasionally, and um, they allowed the hospitals because you don't want you don't want your systems going down. You always have to have a plan for how you're gonna operate in the event of a failure. But anyway, we had that and then, uh, it worked pretty well. The triangulation, never really had to use it. Uh, it was there, it, 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 would, it, it would run normally, just you know, spreading the packets across, but it would also recognize it if it went down. It, I think it was a Cisco uh, router that I was using. First time I'd set one up, I just sat down with a manual and figured it out. But uh, yeah, I got it working anyway. That's a long story from a long time ago. Hope you enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe. We'll see you all again real soon. And bye for now.